We present a DVD on the surgical approaches to the orbit. The aims of the video are to act as a refresher for qualified surgeons and as a training tool for junior surgeons. The orbit is a complex and delicate anatomical region that can house a vast array of pathology, ranging from primary and secondary neoplastic lesions to inflammatory processes through to vascular and bony lesions. The overarching principles in accessing the orbit relate to the quadrantic location of a lesion and the overlapping surgical spaces that exist, as well as the anterior-posterior dimensions of the orbit, as it significantly affects the approach that one takes. Ultimately, however, we aim for optimal access, minimum collateral damage, and an excellent aesthetic outcome. We are going to cover some of the approaches to the anterior orbit, the lateral orbit, the medial orbit, as well as the inferior orbit. We are briefly going to cover endonasal approaches, but it is also important to be aware of superior neurosurgical approaches. The upper eyelid crease incision is very useful in accessing the superior, anterior and deeper orbital spaces. It can be extended both laterally as shown here or medially towards the canthus. This patient has a supralateral orbital mass involving the lacrimal gland. A skin incision is made, an orbicularis and septum are then transected using a hot wire. This reveals a lesion extending from the lacrimal gland to the inferior aspect of the superior orbital rim. The lesion of interest is then gradually exposed and biopsied and sent for histological examination. The skin crease incision is then closed with a running vibral suture. An alternative method for accessing the anterior and medial orbit is the vertical lid split. This allows access to extraconal lesions in this area. This patient has a well circumscribed lesion straddling the intra and extraconal spaces. A perpendicular incision is made at the junction of the medial third and lateral two thirds of the eyelid. Great care is taken to avoid the superior neurovascular bundle, which is seen marked. Skin, orbicularis, and tarsal plate are all transected progressing through to the apex of the conjunctival fornix. Access to the orbit is granted via an incision to the fornicial bulbar conjunctiva. Hand-over-hand -hand dissection is then used with manibal retractors. This lesion is accessed without having to enter the intraconal space. A cryopro is then applied to the lesion, which is gently and continuously raised. The eyelid is then repaired as per any other full thickness lid laceration. The lateral orbitotomy gives excellent access to the lateral and deeper orbit. This patient has a well circumscribed mass in the region of the lacrimal gland. A skin crease incision has already been made, but the same effect could be achieved with the lateral cantholysis and canthotomy. The incision is deepened using monopolar cautery through abicularis down to the periosteum to expose the lateral orbital rim. Good knowledge of emissary vessels and nerves is crucial at this point as they may bleed vigorously. The periosteum is further raised over the zygoma. This video demonstrates the marking for a standard osteotomy. The superior mark is a little above the frontozygomatic suture and the inferior parallel to the superior edge of the horizontal zygomatic arch. Drill holes are pre-placed which are used to suture the bone back following excision of the lesion. The lateral osteotomy is then formed using a reciprocating blade using water as a coolant. The tumour is then gradually dissected out using close blunt scissors, malleable retractors and cotton buds. Care is taken to ensure a cuff of normal tissue where the tumour is adherent to adjacent structures. Once the tumour is excised, the bone can then be replaced and sutured, in this case with proline. The swinging lower lid approach gives excellent access to the inferior and lateral orbit, as well as the orbital walls. This approach is conjunctival with an associated canthotomy and cantholysis. Here, a small canthotomy is made, with straight scissors then passed immediately posterior to the retractors in order to create a pocket. The conjunctival and inferior retractors are then cut using a hot wire, just inferior to the tarsal plate. The space between the retractors and the aponeurotic fat pad is then dissected. The inferior orbital rim 
is then brought into view by retracting the lower eyelid anteriorly and inferiorly with Damar retractors, and the malleable retractor is then used to retract and protect the globe. The tissues are then stretched over the orbital rim and the periosteum is incised. Great care must be taken immediately in view of the presence of the inferior oblique. The orbital rim and the orbital floor are gradually exposed. On closure, the periosteum can be sutured and the tarsal conjunctiva can be repaired with 7 ovicrol. The lateral canthus is then reformed. The front to width modal incision gives access to the medial orbit and the associated wall. A 1 to 2 cm curvilinear incision is made 3 to 4 mm from the medial canthus. The orbicularis is dissected bluntly and the angular vein is often visible and should be preserved where possible. The medial canthal tendon is disinserted to improve access. In this case, a medial orbital wall fracture is being repaired. As bony fragments are removed, great care must be taken to avoid the anterior ethmoidal artery. In this case, a titanium plate is placed over the fracture site. The periosteum and medial canthal tendon are then repaired, followed by the orbicularis and skin, aiming for an excellent cosmetic outcome. The caruncular approach provides versatile access to the medial orbit. An incision is made between the plica and the caruncle. There is then an option to extend this in a crescentic-like fashion. Blunt dissection takes place posteriorly, aiming towards the posterior lacrimal crest. Once again, great care must be taken to avoid the anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries as they can rarely hang inferiorly on the mesentery, although they are rarely seen in this region. The transconjunctival approach also gives access to the medial orbit, but is particularly useful for intraconal lesions. This patient has an intraconal inframedial orbital lesion. A 180 degree peritone is made, and then the inferior and medial recti are identified, hooked, and slung with vascular ties. The inframedial quadrant is then gradually exposed using malleable retractors and blunt dissection. A cavernous hemangioma then comes into view and is gradually dissected out and raised. The subtarsal approach is an effective and straightforward method of accessing the inferior orbit. In this case, the skin has been marked and an incision is made along the lower border of the inferior tarsal plate. Dissection then continues through orbicularis along the direction of its fibres. The dissection continues through the preceptal plane toward the orbital rim. Once periosteum is reached, it is then incised just below the orbital rim using monopolar cautery on a cutting setting. The periosteum is then gently elevated to expose the orbital floor. Vicral sutures can then be used to close the orbicularis and skin in a subcuticular fashion. An alternative approach to the inferior orbit is a subsiliary incision, though this can be associated with a higher rate of postoperative ectropion. In this case, a subsiliary skin incision is made, extending from the inferior punctum at approximately 15 mm towards the lateral canthus. Skin, orbicularis and septum are all transected. The periosteum is then incised at the point of the inferior orbital rim, in this case with a scalpel. The periosteum is then gently elevated, and in this case a search is made for an orbital floor fracture. A titanium plate is then placed at the fracture site. periosteum, orbicularis and skin are then closed sequentially. The endoscopic approach to the orbit is an increasingly popular and versatile method. From an endonasal aspect it provides excellent access to the medial wall, the orbital apex 
and additionally allows optic canal decompression while avoiding craniotomy. This patient is undergoing endonasal endoscopic surgery to access the medial orbit via the ethmoid sinus. Mm -hmm. Here, the periorbiter is seen to be incised with prolapse of orbital fat as part of a medial wall decompression. Throughout this video, we've been able to cover multiple approaches to the orbit, including skin crease incision, vertical lid split, lateral orbitotomy, the swinging lower eyelid approach, frontoethmoidal approach, transcurricular and transconjunctival approaches, subtarsal and subciliary approaches, as well as briefly the endoscopic approach. Though it is important to be aware that occasionally due to a lesion being too posterior or alternatively bridging both intraorbital and intracranial spaces, a combined approach with neurosurgical colleagues may also be required. We hope you found this video to be informative and many thanks for watching.